Today we're going to compare motor systems. We've already discussed the anatomy in detail, but today I want to compare the cortical spinal system, the cerebellar connections, and the basal ganglia circuitry, all of which we've described to you previously in some detail. But today the emphasis is going to be on the clinical signs and symptoms showing you patient videos that correspond to damage in any of these three circuits. The most important circuit, the final common path down to the spinal cord, is the cortical spinal tract. So let's start with that. The cortical spinal tract takes its origin from the cerebral cortex. I'm outlining the central sulcus, which separates frontal lobe from parietal lobe, and motor areas from sensory areas. And the area that gives rise to fibers in the cortical spinal tract actually includes the somatic sensory cortex, or postcentral gyrus, the precentral gyrus, which we associate with motor cortex, and a wedge of premotor areas that are involved with speech and motor planning. So we have a wedge sort of like this that is going to be our origin for the cortical spinal tract. So the colors here represent neurons in the precentral gyrus, the motor cortex, that are descending through the internal capsule as a rainbow of axons representing the leg, the body, the arm, and the face areas as you move from medial to lateral. And they are traveling down and descending in the posterior part of the internal capsule and then they enter the cerebral peduncle. I have another animation, also from the University of Washington Digital Anatomist Project, showing the internal capsule and cortex in a bluish purple color. And you're going to see how these fibers then descend through the brainstem, which we're sectioning here. And the blue fibers come down through the midbrain pons medulla and cross at the level of the beginning of the spinal cord to the opposite side. And so each hemisphere controls the other or opposite side of the body. So this is going to be important for you to remember that disease of the cortical spinal tract above the cord manifests itself on the opposite side. The cerebellum is attached by its three peduncles beneath the occipital pole and lobe and to the brain stem. And it has various regions, which we are going to show you on this specimen. This is the superior surface. So you would be looking at it if you were looking at an MRI like this. These are the hemispheres and the area in the midline is called the vermis. So there is the vermis and the hemispheres, the superior surface and the inferior surface, also with hemispheres. The vermis is a little harder to see on the inferior surface and it's hugging the brain stem. And here you can see the tonsils that sit right over the foramen magnum. If we look at this in a mid-sagittal section, here we have, this is the midbrain, here is the medulla, the fourth ventricle, here is our midline vermis of the cerebellum, and the cerebellum vermis is separated into two areas, one an anterior lobe that is in front of this primary fissure that I'm opening up here. So this is the anterior lobe. We're going to come back and talk to, about that when we talk about alcohol disease. And then this is the rest of the uh, cerebellum. And on the inferior surface now, I turn this around. So here's the hemisphere. Here is the pons with my thumb on it. Here's the medulla. This little area out in here called the flocculus is also involved with um, uh, eye movements and balance and vestibular function of the cerebellum. So now let's go and look at the basal ganglia. Let me remind you of some of the structures of the basal ganglia in this coronal section. 
Let's get oriented. Here we have the body of the caudate. It's much smaller at this level. Uh, out here next to the lateral ventricle. And we have a large thalamus on either side of the third ventricle. And we have a bright white internal capsule, the posterior part of it coming down here. And laterally out to the side, we have the putamen, which is a little bit darker than the globus pallidus. Pallidus has two parts, an internal and an external. And the putamen is very similar to the caudate in its appearance, in its cells. And together it is called the striatum. There's one other structure which I can see, but it's very difficult to distinguish, called the subthalamus that is part of the circuitry. And then finally, we have the substantia nigra that is at the level of the midbrain that works with the uh, basal ganglia as the nigrostriatal pathway. I have a diagram here that I've made to summarize these three circuits. So our most important circuit is the cortical spinal tract, also called the pyramidal tract, which is important for willed and voluntary movements. And we're going to look at that in more detail. We have our cerebellar circuit, which works together with the cord and the cerebral cortex. And we have our basal ganglia circuit. So we're going to discuss each of these in order and look at the signs and symptoms. The first one we're going to study is the cortical spinal tract. So it is the chief. It is the final common pathway that goes from the cerebral cortex down, as you saw in the animation, crosses and decussates at the level of the top of the spinal cord, continues down to the neurons in the spinal cord that go out to the voluntary striated muscles. And these are called the lower motor neurons, which are going down to the muscle end plate through the motor neurons, and these others are called the upper motor neurons. So it's a two synapse pathway, and we have signs and symptoms that are developed when there are damages to either the upper or the lower motor neurons. We're going to look at examples of increased reflexes, signs of spasticity and clonus, uh, Babinski sign, hemiplegia, or hemiparesis. A hemiparesis is a weakness. Uh, finger movements and fine control of them, and uh, the loss of control when you damage the lower motor neurons and get a paralysis, areflexia, atrophy, and fasciculations. We're going to look at this young girl who is being tested for her reflexes. And this is a demonstration of hyperreflexia on her right side because only one side of her uh, cortical spinal tract has been uh, damaged. And uh, he's testing now for ankle reflexes. But again, he's going to show you uh, her knee jerk again. And sometimes the spread from the more normal side, like this one, spreads to the other side. Uh, when there is severe hyperreflexia. But now watch here. It's very pronounced. And this is an excellent example. Uh, and she also will show us some other things in a moment. The Babinski sign is a sign that indicates cortical spinal tract damage by the large or big toe going up and the other uh, digits fanning. This is also called a plantar extensor reflex. But most people say that this is a Babinski sign, and when it's present, it's a positive, meaning present, Babinski sign, another indicator of cortical spinal tract damage. This is an example of clonus. Clonus is an oscillation of flexors and extensors when the Achilles tendon is stretched. It represents another positive sign of cortical spinal tract or upper motor neuron damage. This is our young lady again, and she is being tested for muscle tone. And the tone is extra or excessive, such that there is an increased resistance as he moves her right arm and her right wrist. And compare how much more limber or easy to move her left arm is. This one has resistance to velocity and also 
to movement uh, that is being performed passively. So spasticity is increased resistance to passive stretch. And sometimes as it resists, it gives way and a phenomenon called clasp knife is described uh, as the feeling the physician has as the tension changes during this maneuver. Dr. Larson is continuing to test this girl, and in many cases, finger flexors are severely involved because that's one of the main purposes of the cortical spinal tract. A large number of these upper motor neurons are going for the control of the hand, many more so than are going for the control of the feet. And she has particular difficulty using her finger flexors with her right arm, and he also goes on to test uh, her her mobility and her ability to resist and uh, movement and as well as her strength. So let's watch this examination. A piece of paper and put it in. Good, again. That's pretty hard for that little piece of paper, isn't it? Okay. Here's our young lady uh, again, and she demonstrates a typical hemiparetic gait that affects only the right side of her body. Typical of this gait with her weakness is that her arm is flexed, as is her hand, as you saw before, and also her leg does not uh, uh, track as well. It has to be brought out around, and that is called circumduction. So as she comes toward you, uh, her right leg has to veer out laterally so that it doesn't scrape the floor because her foot is uh, a little bit more extended. So extension of the lower limb and flexion of the upper limb is what you typically see with cortical spinal tract damage. This gentleman has a hemiparetic gait just like the young lady. Uh, it affects his right side. Her right side was affected too. Her right side problem was in her cortex, so that means her left brain or pathway. This gentleman has a cervical myelopathy, so it's in the cord, so that means it would be the cord is being impinged on the same side, producing this weakness. Uh, his hand is flexed, he doesn't have the associated movement of his arm compared with his left arm. Recall, cortical spinal tract damage is more to the extensor of the lower leg and the flexors of the upper extremity. To reinforce what you've just seen, this is an extreme example of a relatively recent stroke or infarct on the right side of the screen, you can see damage to the area of the motor cortex. And this would be a total hemiparesis uh, or paralysis, uh, including all of the internal capsule fibers that are descending to the cortical spinal tract. So this person would have had a contralateral hemi paralysis or hemiparalysis in this case. This is a stained myelin cross-section of the medulla, and the pale area on the left at the bottom represents the area of the pyramid or pathway of the cortical spinal tract. Some other structures are also involved. This patient would have had a severe hemiparesis or paralysis on the opposite side because the tract has not yet crossed. This is often called a medial medullary syndrome. Before we leave the cortical spinal tract, uh, I don't want you to forget that there are signs of lower motor neuron disease that we have not shown you because they're more difficult to show. Atrophy is very uh, obvious when you lose the lower motor neurons or the spinal cord motor neurons or even the cranial nerve motor neurons. And this is an example of both atrophy in the hand and uh, in the muscles of the foot. 
This goes along with a loss of muscle tone, a flaccid paralysis, and loss of reflexes, a reflexia. And sometimes in early stages, you can see a quivering of the denervated muscle called fasciculations. Now it's time to move on to the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, together with the basal ganglia, are merely consultants, so to speak, to the cortical spinal tract or the pyramidal system, all right? So your willed voluntary movements, before they occur, as they're going on all the time, are consulting the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So let's focus right now on the cerebellum. An important thing is that disease of the cerebellum is manifest, shows up on the same side of the body as the part of the hemisphere or midline that is damaged. So cerebellar lesions express themselves on the same side. That's just the opposite of the cortical spinal tract, which was on the opposite side above the spinal cord. So that means that the cerebellar hemisphere has to work with the motor cortex of the opposite side. But we're going to focus just on cerebellar disease, and we can divide that into two regions. The hemispheres that we saw, and the anterior lobe and midline vermis. The anterior lobe and midline vermis work more with the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal cord is constantly sending proprioceptive information from muscle spindles, joints, tendons, to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is comparing the state of the body, so to speak, with the desire of the mind to execute particularly fast, skilled, rapid movements particularly things that you've learned to do with great precision, whether it's tennis or being a concert pianist. Whereas the cerebellum uh, uh, anterior lobe has more, much more to do with posture and gait and just getting you balanced and carrying on uh, with your daily routine life. And so our damage is clustered as either problems with the uh, hemisphere or problems with the anterior lobe. And so let's start with looking at some examples of damage to the hemispheres. Ataxia, or this incoordination of the upper limb and or the lower limb, is a typical sign of cerebellar disease of the hemisphere. This gentleman has difficulty doing what we call the finger-to-nose test. He has difficulty judging the distance, dysmetria, and he also has difficulty doing it in a rapid fashion. He's doing it as fast as he can, and the examiner is moving the finger a bit uh, to make him stretch out and go to a different target. You'll notice that superimposed on that movement is a tremor. So another typical sign of cerebellar disease is what we call intention tremor. It's only there when he tries to do something. It's not there at rest. Let's look at another example. This young woman has a problem of ataxia of her upper limb, but she has more of a dysmetria trying to reach the target without past pointing as she is doing here. And she doesn't have the big uh, oscillations or intention tremor, but you do notice that she has more difficulty the closer she reaches the target that she is aiming for. So this is an example of lower limb ataxia, and it is also a sign of hemisphere difficulty, and this is called the heel to shin test. Okay, can you do that one more time? High up, right on the kneecap, and run it down the shin bone. Okay, and, and I want you to use your heel like that and run it back up. Okay, just go down for me and back up on the shin bone. Okay, good. The physician here is asking the young lady to as quickly as possible flip her hands back and forth. And you'll notice that she's clumsy. You can always compare it with yourself and how fast you can do it. And she has difficulty on both sides. 
And this inability to perform rapid alternating movements is called dysdiadochokinesia. That's a real mouthful, dysdiadochokinesia. And also the patient can be asked to do rapid finger to thumb as fast as you can. And also uh, that can be either diminished or slowed. Again, a problem with fast, rapid movements. The last thing I want to discuss with you about hemisphere disease is change in muscle tone. Recall that with cortical spinal tract, we had spasticity, an increase in muscle tone. And in cerebellar disease, uh, sometimes but not always do you see a hypotonia or a decrease in tone. And normally when you do a reflex, your opposing muscles, the antagonist muscles, uh, tend to stop or check the movement. But in this case, the leg continues to wobble back and forth. And this swinging is not checked and it is called pendular reflexes. So pendular reflexes and hypotonia go along with cerebellar disease. This woman has a hereditary cerebellar degeneration, which also affects the proprioceptive input to the anterior and vermian lobes and regions of the cerebellum. So as she walks, she has a classic ataxic gait and has to have assistance. This is a very severe example, and next I will show you an example from a lesser affected individual. This woman also has pancerebellar degeneration. Her gait is wide-based, and she requires assistance to keep her steady, but her disease is not as uh, exaggerated at this point as the previous example. This patient has a tumor in his cerebellum. It's only on one side. See if you can distinguish which is the affected side. Remember the disease, if it's a cerebellar disease, it's gonna be in the same side of the body as the tumor. And I think you can see that he doesn't swing his right arm as much as his normal left arm and that he has a broad gait to keep his balance, and that he is an example of cerebellar ataxia, but a much more mild uh, example. This gentleman has very severe cerebellar degeneration, so much so that he was unable to stand without help, and so he was placed on the bed here where we could record his postural tremors. And this is called titubation, this oscillation of the trunk, axial titubation or truncal ataxia, and it's so severe that it even involves or invokes the movement of his legs and his head. Again, an example of midline disease. One of the sequelae of alcoholism over a long period of time is cerebellar degeneration. We're looking now at a mid-sagittal section of the cerebellum, and the left side you can see the shriveled or atrophied anterior lobe and also it involves the vermis, which is the cut surface that we're looking at here. So anterior lobe and vermian degeneration are an effect of alcohol, among other uh, cerebral uh, problems. Now why it affects just the anterior lobe and vermis, we don't know. But I'm going to now show you examples of when alcoholism is severe, what are some of the clinical signs that you will see. This gentleman is going to be asked to perform the heel to shin maneuver, which I just showed you as an example of hemisphere involvement. But also the vermis and anterior lobe represent more the lower uh, limbs than the upper limbs. And so he has difficulty running his heel up and down over his shin and shows some deficit then in his heel to shin maneuver on um, both sides. So this disease is, of course, bilateral. This same individual has much less difficulty doing finger to nose than heel to shin. 
And that is because alcoholism, for some reason, spares the hemispheres of the cerebellum, and they're more involved with the upper appendicular musculature. So finger to nose is not a common finding in alcoholism, whereas the damage to the lower limb and its coordination is more severe. When we were looking at the diagram and list of cerebellar signs and symptoms, nystagmus was one of them. It can be cerebellar, it can be vestibular, or it can be brainstem. This young man shows a left beating nystagmus. If you'll notice, his eyes drift to the right and flick back to the left. There are many forms of nystagmus, right, left, up, down, and roundabout. But when you see nystagmus, cerebellum or some of the connections to the cerebellum should be in your diagnosis. We'll look at another example now, too. This gentleman also suffers from uh, spinocerebellar degeneration. And you're going to see prominent nystagmus when he gets to either the right side or the left side when he is looking back and forth horizontally. His eyes do not move evenly. He doesn't have good pursuit. They're a little bit jerky if you compare them with your uh, own eye movements in the mirror or have look at someone else's. So now we're ready to talk about the other consultant to the motor cortex, the basal ganglia. Again, they do not have any direct output to the spinal cord. They have to work through the motor cortex. They get there through the thalamus, just like the cerebellum does, and influence the cortical spinal tract. Now, an important point to remember here is that basal ganglia signs and symptoms that you see in the patient represent disease of the basal ganglia on the contralateral or opposite side of the body. Because the basal ganglia work with the cortex, because the cortex crosses in the cortical spinal tract, the signs and symptoms of basal ganglia disease will be contralateral, just like the signs and symptoms of cortical motor disease. Now, because we had two pathways, a direct and an indirect pathway, in an anatomical sense, we, had, we have two different types of disease categories. We have diseases with too much movement, which we call hyperkinesias, and we have diseases with too little movement, which we call hypokinesias, and we have some that are a mixture of both. So first we're going to look at diseases of the indirect pathway, which because it normally inhibited movement, now when it's diseased we get too much movement. And basal ganglia disease is categorized as a movement disorder, and movement disorder of involuntary movements, that is, movements that you cannot suppress, that you cannot concentrate it as hard as you want. You might be able to diminish them. You can't get rid of them. Also, an interplay between agonists and antagonists. And so we're going to look at a variety of these movement disorders, too much, too little, or a mixture. And now we're going to look at an example of acetosis. And a classic disease in the too much movement is Huntington's disease, which has both acetosis and chorea. Unfortunately, I do not have an example of hemibolismus, which involves disease of the subthalamic nucleus. And I do have examples of iatrogenic or medication-induced dyskinesias, abnormal movements. Let's look at some of these patients now. Uh, this is an example of athetosis of the fingers. This gentleman is being asked to keep his hands still, but his fingers still move. Sometimes it looks like they're trying to play a piano, and he's holding on to his other hand, trying to keep it uh, under control. The sinusoidal movements are always more distal than proximal and can be seen together with chorea. This 51-year-old man has Huntington's disease and shows a good example of a choreiform gait. Notice that it's intruded upon by movements of his hands and his shoulders, his hip, his knee, that are unintentional and unwanted. Unfortunately, this autosomal dominant disease manifests itself later in life after child-rearing years and child-bearing years have come to pass. 
Uh, this unfortunate woman also has uh, Huntington's disease, and she's just asked to uh, pretty much sit still and stand still, but you can see the intrusion of all of these movements, uh, and it makes it uh, difficult for her to speak uh, and is exhausting. Uh, unfortunately, this disease also carries with it dementia. It's called a subcortical dementia because it's not necessarily only in the cortex. It involves these basal ganglia structures which are involved in cognition. So this is an example of a severe stage of Huntington's disease. What we're going to look at now are iatrogenic, or drug-induced in this case, uh, dyskinesias. Sometimes they're called tardive dyskinesias. They come on after long-term, particularly antipsychotic medications, and are called orobuccal and sometimes lingual, orobuccal lingual dyskinesias from long-term drug effects, and they are often uh, irreversible. So this is something you want to keep in mind when uh, using a certain medications, tardive dyskinesias. Now let's listen to him. Dyskinesias can also come from long-term Parkinson's disease medication, as you're going to see in this woman. She has movements, but they're not of the oral buccal type. They're of their parts of her body. Uh, it's quite disconcerting, and you can see she is continuously well, agitated. Well, I take it 5.30, 5.30, and about 6.30 to about 8 or 9 is my most productive time. So I hold it. Finally, we're ready to discuss the last part of our involuntary movement disorders, those that cause too little movement, diseases of the direct pathway, and these are called hypokinesias. Let's look at some of them. Patients with Parkinson's disease have a change in their muscle tone. It's not spasticity, it's rigidity. It's stiff in all directions of movement, and sometimes this is referred to as lead pipe rigidity. Let's watch this examination. When I'm going to check uh, to see how stiff your muscles are. I want you to relax, be as wet as a noodle, eh? Just relax. That's it's having it. a difficult time moving it, no matter what direction or at what noodle. speed. And if you watch the wrist, there's a little bit of a catch in it. And sometimes that is called cogwheel rigidity cogwheel rigidity, as okay. if they were going through little notches in a gear. Have this hand. That Notice that the hand Everybody doesn't flop. Yeah. It's stiff. This gentleman is going to demonstrate for you the very typical Parkinsonian gait, which is a shuffle with small steps, difficulty initiating it, called bradykinesia, and difficulty turning with lots of small steps, sometimes referred to when severe as end block turning. Notice that he doesn't move his arms very much as he walks. Notice his stooped posture. And if you could see his face, his face is practically expressionless with very little blinking. Now let's watch his examination. Walk back. Make a quick turn for me. And walk. Come back. This 74-year-old gentleman also has Parkinson's disease, and you're going to see that his one arm has a greater uh, difficulty in movements, both of the arm, the hand, and the fingers. This asymmetry is often typical in the presentation and eventual evolution of Parkinson's disease. And we're going to watch him, and you'll notice that he also has a tremor. This differs from cerebellar tremor, this is called resting tremor. So the tremor is there when he is not doing something, but the minute commanded to do it, it either disappears or decreases significantly. Let's watch him. I'd like for you to put your hands out in front of you. You can spread your fingers apart. 
and take that index finger you see, and touch your nose. When he's told to do With something, it stops, but then when he has his arms extended and, uh, at rest, and, it begins again. And back and now he's going to do times. the finger to nose maneuver. Can you touch my finger? And, and you see the tremor face. decreases when he's doing something it's intentionally. So this is so a resting tremor that he has. Okay, that's excellent. If this were cerebellar like disease, he would have dysmetria and intention hand. tremor. My and his hand up there at rest while he's doing something else with the other arm, and you can see that the tremor returns. He also has some tremor in the leg. We're going to look at what is called retropulsion. Because the patient has difficulty initiating movements, his response time to a gentle push forward or backward or to the right or left is delayed so that they often tend to fall. So this retropulsion is an example of that bradykinesia and stiffness of his movements. I'm going to give you a little push. I'm going to push you forwards, sideways, or backwards. Eh? And uh, I'll be here to hold you. I won't let you fall. Okay? Okay. And you try to hold your position there, eh? Keep your it's position. the backwards that's harder, because he doesn't have his eyes to help him. One more time. See, it's, it's worth going backwards. A very easy okay. test. Doing great. So this concludes our discussion on comparison of the motor systems. Remembering that the cortical spinal tract trumps everything. If it's not working, then you will not see these subtle basal ganglia and cerebellar signs because of the hemiparesis, paralysis, and lack of motor control. However, if the cortical spinal tract is working and you see disease that is motor, think is it an involuntary movement that the patient has no control over? And if so, is it too much movement or abnormal movements? Think basal ganglia, particularly if there is a resting tremor. On the other hand, if the problem comes with doing motor acts and it's uncoordinated, think ataxia. And if there is a tremor during the movement or action that is ataxic, you want to think cerebellum. So maybe these motor circuits will be a little easier for you to remember now that you've seen some of these clinical examples.